Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 176 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining us for this long overdue mailbag episode where we respond to listener questions submitted via email and social media. And I got to tell you, we've been super happy with all the listener engagement we've been getting. So please keep your questions coming and we'll hopefully have a chance to answer them on air so that everyone can benefit from your curiosity. But before we jump in here, I've got one very important announcement. Our next Modern Bar Cart Live themed tasting is going to take place on Sunday, February 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And in case you're not familiar with what this is, it's basically a free crash course in a particular spirits category. We pick three or four bottles that we'll be tasting, and starting with this upcoming stream, we're going to be sharing them with you ahead of time in case you'd like to pick up one or more of those bottles and taste alongside us in real time. The theme for this upcoming tasting is bourbon, America's spirit, and we'll be joined in person by special guest Erin Petrie, who is a senior contributor at Bourbon and Banter. She'll be walking us through a tasting designed to familiarize your palate with different bourbon styles and mash bills, and I'm about to read the four bottles we'll be tasting in case you need a chance to pause this episode and grab a pen and paper. The bottles are Rebel Yell Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Elijah Craig Small Batch, Four Roses Single Barrel, and Wild Turkey 17-Year Bottled in Bond. Now, at least the first two bottles, the Rebel Yell and the Elijah Craig, should be pretty easy to source and pay for at many, if not most, liquor stores. The Four Roses Single Barrel is going to be somewhere in the $50 to $75 range and well worth it, in my opinion. And let's just say if you decide to pick up a bottle of the Wild Turkey 17-year just to taste along with us, well, I think Wild Turkey would owe us a commission in that case because that one comes with an extremely hefty price tag. But, you know, we do try and crack open a special bottle in each tasting, so we'll consider that last one our big treat for the month. We'll have links to these bottles on the show notes page, and you can feel free to join the stream on Modern Bar Cart's Instagram, Twitch, or YouTube profiles, as well as on my personal Facebook profile if you happen to be connected to me that way. I know we have an Instagram-loving audience, but if you'd prefer a slightly higher resolution experience, both with the video and the audio, definitely aim for Facebook or YouTube because those will be streaming horizontal HD video. Last thing to note here is that we do have Glencairn nosing and tasting glasses as well as the Essential Tasting Journal for Spirits and Cocktails for sale over at modernbarcart.com. So if you're serious about your booze and getting better at tasting, well, it might just be worth picking up some tools to help you along your journey. I do hope to see you on Sunday, February 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern for some delicious bourbon, which, you know what? reminds me that it might be time to teach you how to make a new bourbon drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Elmo Cola. To make a batch of this, you'll need one bottle of straight bourbon whiskey, one or two vanilla beans, one or two handfuls of ripe pitted dark cherries, and a high quality cola. You could also play around with the delicious True Cola Syrup by Pratt Standard, which you can pick up right from our e-commerce store at modernbarcart.com. Now, a couple things bear explaining here. First off, according to a recent Punch article by Robert Simonson, the Elmo Cola was invented by bar consultant Tim Kirkland for the St. Elmo Steakhouse in Indianapolis. Second, there's not what I would consider a true formulation for this drink because it's something of a proprietary secret. So take my speculative recipe as a template and feel free to tweak it from there. To prepare a batch of this drink, which is kind of a love child between a rock and rye and a cherry Coke, you'll want to infuse the bourbon with the vanilla bean for about three days to a week. 
you'll notice we haven't added the cherries yet. And that's because those are gonna lower the proof of the bourbon, making the vanilla extraction less effective. So be sure to do the beans first. Then do a slightly shorter extract on the cherries. I'd recommend about 48 hours shaking periodically. Apparently, the St. Elmo's recipe uses both sweet and tart cherries from Michigan, but if that's a little bit much for you to source, just pick the kind that appeals most to your palate and stick with that variety. Also, if the spirit moves you, you can always add a little bit of cherry juice to brighten, sweeten, and lengthen things. Recently, a bottled version of the Elmo Cola base minus the cola, was launched in Indiana, and according to Simonson, it's bottled at 88 proof, 44% alcohol by volume, which suggests that a fairly high proof bourbon is used to extract the cherry and vanilla before then being diluted by the cherry juice. So I'd lean toward using a bonded bourbon, which is something at least 50% ABV for this project, if at all possible. When it comes time to serve your Elmo Cola, all you need to do is pour two ounces of that infused bourbon over ice, top with four to six ounces of your favorite cola, then garnish with a brandied cherry, and if you're feeling fancy, an expressed orange twist. So now that you're officially part of the in crowd when it comes to the cocktail that's taking Indiana by storm, let's jump straight into this mailbag episode. This first question comes to us from our listener, Robbie, via Instagram, who messaged us saying, Hiya, great pod. Wondering if you can get more specific than the Bar Cart Foundation's hardware episode about where to get a bar cart slash sturdy surface under $500. So far, I've started with an X-shaped keyboard stand with a spray-painted piece of plywood on top, and I'm looking for something a bit sturdier, maybe an affordable bar cart with a rustic-style look. Thanks. Well, Robbie, I'm really glad that you reached out because this is a great reminder that we can always go back and add to our foundation's material. It's probably been about three years since that episode launched, and I've definitely learned a lot in that time. So let's tackle this question together. When it comes to bar carts, or what I'll otherwise refer to as bar cabinets or dry bars, You've got a number of great options out there, but you really need to be honest with yourself at the outset about how handy you intend on being with this project. If you're pretty good with tools, there are a lot of really cheap options for making a custom bar cart or dry bar, but if you don't have a good set of tools or much experience working with wood or metal, I'd recommend just kind of forking out the money and saving yourself a lot of aggravation. In my experience, the best way to get a really nice bar cart for an affordable price is to keep your eyes peeled at antique stores. You could even call around to a bunch of them in your area and ask if they have any bar carts in stock. That could save you the hassle of driving all over the place. This approach is best for people who either really enjoy that little chemical rush when you get a great deal on something, or conversely, for those folks who enjoy taking their time and enjoying the process of the hunt. Personally, I sourced my bar cart from front of the podcast, Brandy, here in D.C., who loves to refurbish vintage furniture, but that was complete luck on my part. I will say I was able to upgrade the wheels on my bar cart by purchasing some vintage-looking casters on Amazon for about 15 bucks, and I'll have a link to those, the ones that I used, on the show notes page for this episode. Speaking of wheels or casters, this brings us to an important question when it comes to sourcing a bar cart. Do you really need to move it? Bar carts were initially designed for table-side service at restaurants, where the bartender would actually construct your drink right in front of you. But in most cases, home or apartment bar carts are relatively stationary, which means you might even pose the question, does your setup even need to be on wheels in the first place? Or put differently, are wheels a practical or an aesthetic consideration. Next, you want to think about the materials you want your bar cart to be made of. Most of the cheaper ones out there are made of aluminum, particle board, or in some cases, soft wood like pine or poplar. Expensive bar carts tend to employ sturdier or richer materials like brass, stainless steel, glass, and hardwood, but these materials really increase the price. So if money is your primary concern, You know, you're left with two options. Source the materials and build it yourself. 
So the labor is where you're saving money there or settle for an attractive but less luxurious pre-made bar cart. In that second case, you'll be saving money on the materials but paying for the labor of somebody else assembling it. Ultimately, judging by the tone of Robbie's question, I have two big pieces of advice. First, get to know your ideal dimensions. If you plan on actually using your bar cart or bar cabinet for constructing drinks, make sure that it hits that sweet spot for you so that you're not having to bend down to stir or pour your cocktails. To figure out what that optimal height is, all you gotta do is take a tape measure and record the height of your favorite meal prep surface. In essence, the place in your home where you'd naturally make a cocktail if you didn't have a bar cart. Armed with that knowledge, you can make smart choices that you won't regret when you finally get the thing inside your home. Also, if you're planning to store bottles inside your bar cart, because keeping them out of sight is important to you, well, you'd better make sure that your bar cart has a cabinet large enough to accommodate even the tallest bottles you tend to keep around. So in both of those cases, a tape measure is going to be your best friend. Second, think outside the box when it comes to materials sourcing. There are some DIY bar cart builds out there on places like Etsy or Pinterest or I don't know, wherever people put those things that involve going to Lowe's or Home Depot and picking up some wood, some paint, some screws, and then following a set of pictures and instructions online. But I'd recommend trying to find a store that sells like reclaimed wood or recycled materials, something like a cross between a hardware store and an antique mall. There's one near DC called Community Forklift, which I'll link to in the show notes, and I've sourced some really cool wood for bookshelves there, and I guarantee they have lots of stuff that's just begging to be transformed into a bar cart. So if you can find a place like that, and I do know that they exist elsewhere in the country, that would be pretty much a gold mine for anyone who has a DIY mindset. Just be more interesting than the stuff that you find on Pinterest. Last thing to note here, Robbie, what if you imagine the look of your ideal bar cart just in your mind? Ditch the keyboard stand altogether. What does it look like to you? What are you imagining? Once you have a good picture, I'd simply ask, is there a more affordable piece of furniture that this bar cart resembles? And if there is, why not just source that style of nightstand or desk and simply install some wheels on it so that it becomes a bar cart? The answer to your question could be as simple as that. If Robbie or anyone else out there has the chance to flex those DIY muscles and make a cool bar cart, we do hope that you'll take a chance to send some pictures and share your process via Instagram, Facebook, or email. Our next question, which is more of a general interest topic, comes courtesy of friend of the pod, Greg in Kansas City. You may remember a giveaway of his cocktail artwork that we did a little while back. He recently reached out asking about sourcing affordable spirits decanters, which got me thinking that we've never really covered this subject outside of our Infinity Bottles interview with Chad Robinson, so I figured we'd cover some decanter basics in this episode prompted by his question. First off, there are two basic types of decanters out there in the beverage world, both with different morphologies and purposes. Of course, you've got your wine decanters. These tend to have a wide belly or base with a slender neck, and the purpose is to allow a mature wine to open up by exposing it to oxygen for a short period of time before serving. So if you were to cook a really nice meal, you might decant your wine 30 minutes to two hours prior to the meal so that it has time to breathe a bit. That said, we're not here to talk about wine decanters. We're talking booze decanters, and these tend to look quite a bit different. Unlike wine decanters, spirit decanters play a mostly, or depending on who you ask, an entirely aesthetic function in that spirits don't really benefit from oxidation post-bottling in the same way that wines do. When you buy a nice wine, generally there's the expectation that it's going to continue maturing in the bottle as long as you cellar it in the appropriate conditions. But with spirits... Well, I mean, distillers stick those things in bottles specifically to halt the aging and oxidation process that takes place in a barrel. So giving your whiskey time to breathe, quote unquote, doesn't make nearly the same sort of sense that it does with wine. 
As such, Spear decanters will always have some sort of lid or stopper to prevent more air from getting to the booze. And they're generally going to look kind of fancy and be faceted in order to catch the light and show off your fancy scotch or brandy. This makes spirits decanters mostly decorative or ceremonial. Now, another thing to consider with decanters is the material that they're made of. Generally, it's going to be crystal or glass. A little history lesson. Back in 1675, an Englishman named George Ravenscroft invented crystal, which was a glassmaking technique that employed lead oxide, which helped to form silicate crystal structures in the glass. These crystals, it turns out, are great at a few things. They're exceptionally clear, they really catch the light, and they form prisms, right? So if you've ever seen like a really nice like crystal chandelier, not only does it amplify the light, but it kind of makes the light dance and play. Now, you may have caught the word lead, And yes, if you put a spirit into a leaded crystal decanter, that lead will leach out and you'll find yourself consuming lead soup. I can't imagine that that would make the booze taste very good and it certainly ain't good for you, which is precisely why we're lucky to have unleaded crystal available in today's market, which uses uh, barium oxide, zinc oxide, or potassium oxide to achieve the same basic effect as using lead, except with less of the poison. In some antique stores, you may still come across decanters or glassware using leaded crystal, so there is still the need to exercise a bit of caution, but if you're purchasing a decanter from a modern retail operation, you can almost bet that it's going to be safe to drink from. Just a few other nuts and bolts to consider here. If you're looking at a decanter in a store or in a high-resolution image and you can locate a seam in the glass, basically like a line that's running symmetrically from the top to the bottom of the decanter, that means that it was produced using a glass mold instead of being hand-blown like the more premium expensive crystal. Just a little quality indicator to look for there. Also, because the additives, crystal is going to be heavier than normal glass. So if you're forced to make a material speculation based purely off your senses, the weight of the decanter can be a good hint about its composition. Finally, just because spirits decanters have lids to prevent further oxidation doesn't mean that your spirits won't undergo other types of degradation if they sit for extended periods of time. So if you do choose to display your spirits in a decanter, try to keep them away from direct sunlight, which can do all sorts of funky things to what would otherwise be a perfectly nice barrel-aged spirit. In terms of sourcing decanters, that are both affordable and sexy? Well, turns out that both Greg and I are still scratching our heads on this one. So if you've got a line on something you think might fit well on our e-commerce store, for example, please do kindly drop us a line and we'll take a look. The next question comes to us from Candice in Washington State, who emailed saying, Hey, Eric and team, hope you're all staying safe and drinking well. I'm writing because I wasn't in time to snag one of the fog hat cocktail smokers during the holidays, so I figured I'd see if you had any advice on at-home cocktail smoking projects that won't break the bank. My husband and I don't own a smoker, but if I'm being honest, we've been looking for an excuse to get an affordable one if there's any you'd recommend. Thanks in advance. Well, Candice, I hope you're also staying safe and drinking well, and for those of you who haven't visited our store recently. We launched some cocktail smokers over the holidays that turned out to be very, very popular. So popular, in fact, that we're still out of stock. But this is a great opportunity to do two very American things. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and play with fire. I will say that the book that got me into smoking is called Project Smoke by a fella named Stephen Reichlin. We'll link to that over on the show notes page. I like this book because it really is an all-in-one guide to smoking that doesn't assume you know the first thing about what you're doing. And I certainly didn't until about a year ago. Since then, and with the help of that book, I've been able to make a bunch of really nice smoked foods. We're talking salmon, we're talking brisket. I did like a smoked trout version of whitefish salad. So this is a great inspiration for me to turn my efforts more in a liquid direction. Now, 
Before you go out and buy a smoker, you need to consider this one fact. You can make a smoker using basically a hot plate, a box, and some wire cooking racks. There's an old Alton Brown video on YouTube, which we'll also have on the show notes page, where he demonstrates this procedure, and I gotta say, it's almost mesmerizingly simple. That said, my co-founder Rusty happened to have gifted me a Little Chief smoker as a housewarming gift a couple years ago, and that's been serving me quite well for all my smoking endeavors. Online, that model is selling for about 100 bucks. so if that doesn't break the bank for you, Candice, consider it modern bar cart approved. Before we get into cocktail smoking projects, I just need you to be aware of one slight nuance. Hot smoking versus cold smoking. Hot smoking is when you put a food, or in this case a beverage, in a container for an extended period of time with the heat source that is creating that smoke. Whereas cold smoking takes the smoke and funnels it into a second container that's away from the heat source. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you say, huh, this thing I want to smoke probably shouldn't get too hot, that's a situation where you might want to employ something like a smoking gun and cloche, which is a little electric tool that pipes smoke under a bell-shaped glass thing that looks like a cake stand cover, or go crazy and build yourself a cold smoking box. But I don't expect that you'll encounter this problem if you just want to experiment at home. I just wanted you to understand the difference between hot smoking and cold smoking. Now, in a cocktail, there are three things that you can sort of logically smoke. You can smoke the cocktail itself or an ingredient in that cocktail. You can smoke the ice that you serve the cocktail over, or you can smoke the garnish. Each of these things can yield very different results. To me, the easiest and most gratifying smoking projects are the ones that keep giving. So here's a few ideas in no particular order that should optimize for both ease of execution and multiple applications. First up, smoked cocktail syrups. All you need to do is make a cocktail syrup, right? This could be a rich, simple syrup, fruit syrup, or even something like a molasses, agave, or honey syrup. Then, and here's the key, put it in your smoker in as wide a container as possible so that you're maximizing the smoke contact with the syrup. You don't want to stick it in there in like a carafe or, you know, some container with a narrow top to it. Otherwise, the smoke's not going to be able to get to the syrup. Once you've got it in sort of that wide mouth pan or container, smoke it for maybe an hour or so, stirring once or twice to make sure that you're moving that syrup around and again, maximizing for contact with the smoke. This is a great candidate for hot smoking because you have to heat the syrup to make it anyway, so there's really no harm or foul by adding heat to the equation. Now, if you were to try and put an entire pre-made cocktail into a smoker for an hour, let's say like a Negroni or an Old Fashioned, you might be at risk for some serious evaporative loss if the smoker gets too hot, and then there's the added hassle of chilling the drink back down before you serve it, which is why I'm just a way bigger fan of smoking syrups in large batches and smoking cocktails individually using devices like the aforementioned fog hat smoker. Next, if smoking syrups sounds like a bit of a hassle, then perhaps the place to start for you might just be to smoke your ice, or rather, to smoke the water that you use to create your ice. This can be done in much the same fashion as smoking a syrup, but you need to expect to lose some of the water to evaporation the longer it stays in that smoker. And you need to be realistic about your expectations for clear ice once you freeze it. See, smoke leaves particles behind. That's where the flavor comes from, and and these particles are going to fall to the bottom of whatever mold you put your water in, and it's going to freeze last. That's just how ice works. All of the particulates and the impurities are the last things to kind of freeze in the bottom to center of a large cube. That means if you want that smoky flavor, you probably won't have crystal clear ice. And if you strive for crystal clear ice, you're probably going to lose some, but not all of the smoky flavor. Just want to give you a few things to optimize for, depending on what your preferences are. Finally, Consider the humble garnish. Smoked culinary garnishes are a delight in that they bring a bit of subtlety into the normally hairy, barrel-chested world of smoked flavors. You can make your cocktail, like you usually do, and then just add a hint of smoke with the garnish. I like this move. 
And not just because smoke is primarily something you perceive via your olfactory sense, but also because smoking something is a great way to preserve it. So if you're planning a brunch or a small gathering, you can smoke the garnishes ahead of time and put them in a quart container in the fridge in the day or two leading up to the event itself. The best types of garnishes to smoke are going to be protein or vegetable related. Here I'm thinking smoked olives, smoked pearl onions for a Gibson, smoked carrots for a custom cocktail, or you could get adventurous and if you have a smoker where you can control the temperature well enough, you could also play around with dehydrated citrus wheels, but smoky. I haven't done that one myself, so I can't recommend the exact temperature or procedure, but in theory, a smoker kind of works similarly to a dehydrator. You just need a little bit of control in the process, and you might make a few dud batches before you finally get your procedure down pat. The nice thing about smoking your garnishes in a large format is that it forces you to almost go back to the drawing board and find a cocktail formulation that will jive with that particular nose and flavor, which is a great way to break out of a rut and infuse some creativity into your at-home cocktail menu. One last note here. There are many different wood chips on the market that you can use to smoke. The ones that I personally enjoy the most are hickory, apple, and mesquite, which all have very unique flavors. Hickory is almost that prototypical smoke flavor. Mesquite, on the other hand, is oily and a little bit salty to my palate, great for pairing with like a mezcal or a scotch, and apple lends a hint of fruity sweetness to the smoke profile. So for what it's worth, those are my favorite woods to use in the smoker. We're going to wrap up this mailbag episode with a question from Jess, who's a bartender in California. She emailed me a couple days ago with a bone to pick about a comment I made in my recent interview with Christian Krogstad, creator of Aviation Gin. She writes, Hi, Eric, big fan of the podcast. It's been really nice listening during quarantine since I'm not able to get behind the bar and do what I love as often. I was listening to this week's interview with Christian Krogstad, and I was a little surprised to hear you describe aviation as a citrus-forward gin. I always thought of it as spicy and nuanced, but not so much citrusy. Do you know something that I don't? Just wondering why our palates register such different flavors. Maybe I'm just bored, but I figured I'd ask. Cheers, Jess. Well, Jess, that's a great question. And you know what? It actually prompted me to go back to my bottle of aviation gin and give it the old Glen Cairn treatment to see if I'm the problem here. And it turns out I am, so you got me. But if you give me a chance, I can explain myself. Normally when I enjoy aviation gin, it's in my wife's favorite drink, in aviation, or in some other citrus-forward cocktail. So in my Cro-Magnon brain, I've been conditioning myself for years to think citrus when I see aviation gin, and part of the reason why I think aviation is such a lovely pairing with citrusy cocktails is because it has a delicate yet distinct blend of really round botanicals that go into the cocktail shaker and give all that racy citrus juice a big old hug so that it calms down and really results in a balanced drink. This is the allure of the new American style of gin, which is going to hopefully be featured in one of our subsequent theme tastings on the live stream. To be sure, this is a category that deserves its own full episode, but the basic gist is that the loads of juniper you tend to find in London dry style gins play a very different role in a citrus forward cocktail than the subtler and perhaps more mischievous new American style. So good catch, Jess. I let my cocktail conditioning get ahead of me on that description, but I stand by the opinion that aviation gin is one of my favorites when you need to make a bright and tangy yet sophisticated drink. That about does it for this mailbag episode. If you'd like your question featured in one of our future shows, well, the first step is to write in and ask one. That email address is, as always, podcast at modernbarcart.com. Hopefully, my answers have given you some good food for thought. Remember to check out our free upcoming bourbon tasting crash course, which I mentioned at the top of this episode, and I will catch you next time right here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Cheers.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed and a little bit of mailbag magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.